Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I'm here with Sam Rolfes, and my name is Alexander Boyce, and I am a producer here at Serpentine Gallery's Arts Technologies team. And this evening, we will be talking about Fay 2 Art by Metaverse and Sam's practice. Um, but before we start, I wanted to do some general introductions because I have the rest of my team here with me. I have Head of Arts Technologies, Kay Watson, Ralph Pritchard, who is our tech manager, uh, Ava Yeager, Associate Arts, <laughs> Arts and Technologies Curator, and our Commissions Producer, Tamar Clark-Brown. I'm also joined by our lovely BSL um, assistants, Julie and Sarah. And I just wanted to let everybody know at home that uh, we will be switching BSL interpreters every 15 minutes or so. Cool. Um, so to give everyone a bit of background, uh, Fay 2 Art by Metaverse, as the name suggests, is about Metaverse technologies, in particular how art production and those technologies are becoming more spatial, persistent, concurrent, interactive, and uh, particip participatory based. Um, and in terms of Fay 2 when we conduct our primary research, we like to interview a range of different professionals from different disciplines. Uh, these include people from gaming, architecture, education, and most importantly, artists, of which Sam was one. In terms of this research, ordinarily, it's quite a private um, production process, and that's why we do these lives, because uh, that way we can invite you, our audience, to understand how we conduct that research. Um, so, to begin, I just wanted to also let everybody know that if you require closed captioning to experience the live stream, down the bottom of your screen, in the bottom right-hand corner, there's some CC options and a toggle to manipulate. Uh, Ava and Kay will be dropping some instructions in within the, within the chat on Twitch to, to manipulate that, as you will. Also, if you want to participate in the chat, you'll need a Twitch account to set up. So Ava and Kay will also drop in some instructions for that, too. Towards the end of the session, we'll be asking Sam and potentially myself some questions. So throughout the discussion, please drop them into the chat. Ava and Kay will compile them and then direct them towards us towards the end. Um, but before we begin, Sam, uh, I wanted to read out this really great bio that I came across on, on Clot Mag. I don't remember if you remember the interview. Oh, oh, sure. Yeah, there were some interesting uh, descriptions in there. Yeah, yeah. Let's hear it. I kind of feel like writing artist bios are a bit of like an artwork in themselves. But I'm going to read this out. I'd say so. <laughs> American artist Sam Rolfes plays musical chairs, switching between the roles of an experimental electronic musician, 3D animator, VR performer, graphic designer, director, and also a writer. His animations are improvised, his collaborations unconventional, while his performance is ever more complex thanks to his extra, ex extra experimental use of technology. Currently based in NYC, where he moved from Chicago a few years ago, he, he is also a co-founder of, co of now defunct art music collective Join the Studio and digital performance image studio Team Rolfs, collabor collaboratively with his brother Andy or his, or his own, Sam, oh sorry, Andy, on his own, <laughs> Sam works with VR, mixed reality, figurative animation, and motion capture tools to create music videos, video games, or live improv improvisational performances. Rolf's surreal imagery, sometimes sublime and often, often psychosexual uh, uh, images, explore human identity through the contemporary computer-based image making. Visceral, color saturated, full of moist flesh, taking place in wonderlands or in hell, his videos permeate the screen with juicy environments overflowing with thrilling microcosms of dreaming uh, creatures. So with that in mind, Sam, <laughs> how do you feel about that? And I was wondering, how do you explain your practice to people that you haven't met before? Because I think that would be a really great introduction to those that may not be familiar with your work. Sure. That was actually closer than I remembered. Um, I did a lot of times um, interview, like when I'm being interviewed, sometimes people grab old interviews that I use. I mean, I've been doing them since just like habitually since like 2010 or something like that. And they'll grab, for some reason, those are oftentimes prioritized on Google results um, because they didn't put dates on, on them. So people will bring up, think that I'm still living in Texas or doing, you know, this or that. So, but, but that one was pretty, pretty key. Um, Right these days, I try and just quickly contextualize as like 
you know, hi, I'm Sam. Uh, I run this digital performance studio with my brother. I, that's kind of how I've been contextualizing it lately. And 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 digital performance and image studio, I guess. But um, they all arise from the same place, which is uh, kind of expressive, responsive. Uh, kind of uh, di digital art making um, that can take form, you know, all the forms that you mentioned, um, but oftentimes whether or not it's like sculpting a character or developing in a virtual environment or the choreography of the character through that environment, it's usually done kind of live to a certain extent, like may even if it's not recorded on the first take, like I'm figuring it out live, I'm kind of responding to the space or even just responding to a character based on different stimuli like collaging mm -hmm. and things like that. So. Um, yeah, di digital performance is the kind of buzz where I've started going with. Yeah, because I mean, marry that all together. you're a traditionally trained painter, right? And mm -hmm. and watercolor in particular. That was my brother. Was watercolor. Oh, I did brother. more. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I did uh, uh, oils, mixed media. My my final year in in art school was like, I would be doing. I would start. I was, was doing kind of like digital digital kind of like experimentations of like like messing with photographs make them making them looking look kind of like I don't know, architectural or kind of fractured or something and then i would print them i got a, i had a japanese paper craft program and i would so that kind of like takes a 3d model and unwraps it to be something you can cut out and then put back together so i was like doing that and then doing like experimental print processes where you sent you like screen print a digital ground medium which is supposed to hold the digital ink and you like send it through an ink so you send it through the school's inkjet which will break eventually from this process but you send it through and then where where that kind of invisible ground medium is, is laid down the, the the pigment sticks and the rest it kind of like flows around so anyway i was doing more kind of physical mixed media stuff yeah. moving towards digital it, i mean it might help if i actually bring up some of the images sure. that you sent through to me so some of mm -hmm. these are great um the reason why i asked sam is because i mean as a producer working at Serpentine Galleries, we, and within the Arts Technologies team, we're exploring this tech all the time, but when we encounter artists, the number one question that we get is like, I'm a painter, I'm a sculptor, I'm a performance artist. How do I equip myself with the knowledge, technical understanding, and know how to start venturing into this world? Um, I, mm -hmm. I wonder if you can ex explain to the audience a little bit how you managed to do that, especially because I remember, not to put words in your mouth, but I remember from your original interview, you were like, some of it was like really playing with the technology and the tools, but other parts of mm -hmm. it was networking, right? Like that was really important yeah. for your practice. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, it was a, it's been a long process. I mean, I, I started doing, I mean, our, our mom like ran a 3D studio when we were kids. So like we had books around, but we didn't really, we weren't really into it. It was like 3D, like it was 3DS Max and Blender books from like 1995 or something like that, or 2000, I guess probably 2000. Um, and it was just kind of inarticulate, but I had like a baseline level of that, but it was, wasn't was really of interest. And I didn't really get back into it until I had graduated art school and then like just, just BFA and then moved to Austin then mo then moved back to Chicago to work with this painter, Wesley Kimler. And I, I the thing that kept me away from it is just because it was so, it felt cold and sterile. It's like moving points around the same, same thing that I feel about keyframing animation. Like, you know, you can do very beautiful stuff with that, but it's, it's not for me. Um, and so it took me finding, coming across ZBrush, which is like a sculpting program mm -hmm. um, to real, to find my path in. Cause prior to that, I was, just, I was doing, I was doing like flyers and posters and stuff, but it was mostly me painting. I would like print stuff out, paint on them, collage them and then scan it and then do a digital pass on it. So I was, I was, I was working with multiple layered media, but not fully 3D. Um, cause I was looking for that, that stepping stone that, that came, that was felt, um, natural to me to, to, for the art making process. So got into ZBrush, um, started messing around with some of the things and some of the stuff being pictured here, um, and started immediately trying to work that into, I was already doing, I'd been throwing shows in Chicago, like weird experimental shows, like music shows, uh, with a little bit of art. Um, and so I was already doing a little flyer design I was starting to do kind of like music video -y things. Um, and I tried to implement that in immediately into that partially cause I could just work much faster as a painter. I was just taking forever. It was too la labored. There was too many layers and stuff. Um, so I could just kind of churn things out, which, you know, given the current era is almost a necessity, um, and be more responsive to stuff. Um, and so. I started getting into that and I learned in my, a lot of my early visual stuff, doing uh, stuff on for like VJing basically for stages. And then like this first kind of attempt at a music video was basically misusing 
it was like get digging into ZBrush, which is a totally weird program. It doesn't, it has a different, it's like two and a half D. It has very weird logic to it. Um, but I found you could kind of rig up. It's not the proper way you like mm -hmm. proper way you rig a 3D character, but you can kind of rig them up for posing typically. And you can kind of marionette them around in like a really funny, like cartoonish way that doesn't look like normal 3D animation. Um, and I, that's basically all I did for like a year was just playing shows and, and uh, doing this kind of like some music video attempts and little animations here and there that are just like puppeting, but uh, puppeting characters around and in ZBrush, you can't render anything um, really. So, I, but you can, they have a function for screen recording functionally that is oftentimes used for um, time lapses. Like when somebody's sculpting, you see the, like, you know, turns from a sphere into like a beautiful face or what, or like a big buff guy because it's gaming industry stuff. Um, and so usually it's used for that, but I realized like, oh, I could, if I like record it slowly while I'm doing my thing, I can make an entire video out of this. Cause I and yeah. really not, I had done flash animation previously like when I was a kid, but I hadn't done animation in years really. Um, so it, it was just a slow process of that. And then, and just finding, like really finding out what I respond to just naturally, like what just isn't a pain in the ass. Like it's all a pain in the ass. Like all, like working in Unreal is I'm mad 90% of the time. I cannot tell you the amount of rage that I get out of that program, but it's a much more natural kind of like, you know, through yeah. line from my previous work and through my personal context than all the other stuff. So it was like basically finding what that is, like finding what the, the core interest is it finding looking playing around with stuff and then saying like do i see myself in here like do i see a, a you know something that speaks to me personally from where i'm at um exploring that trying to find you know your own thing your own way with it and then yeah just i mean getting into the scene i did it through music primarily mm -hmm. um which is you know the, you just you go to shows you get to know people you play shows you post stuff i mean at least you know with music and stuff people are very happy to one one there's a lot more just like promotion and people needing imagery just consistently um, and there are sometimes budgets, which helps. So there's like, I, I've ended up in this economy where it's like, it's ba oftentimes based around album release cycles. And I just have to like retrofit my work into an otherwise commercial promotional kind of thing, which sucks, but that's that's um, the way that I found it. So yeah, a, a lot of just networking to, or and just getting, being part of a community and getting yeah. to know other people and stuff like that. Because so. that kind of segues into something that I wanted to bring up, which is some mm -hmm. really recent work that you did with Danny Elfman, right? Um, yeah, because you mentioned like puppetry and character rigging, um, of which this particular music video uses a lot of, right? Yes. But I mean, going from something like ZBrush all the way to Unreal Engine, it's not one step, is it? It's like mo like experimenting with multiple programs in between. Um, yes, to an extent. It for me, it kind of was just a jump. Because I was like, I was kind of stuck with, I mean, granted, this also required my brother getting into Cinema 4D and Maya and stuff like that, because it does require a certain amount of rigging and processing and stuff that ZBrush can't do entirely itself. It can do a lot of stuff, but not everything. And so it, I, I'm definitely relying on my brother and, and, you know, oftentimes we hire big, you know, teams of people to, to handle different things. Um, but for me, it was honestly, it was primarily like ZBrush and then figuring out Unreal and like late 2015 early 2016 mm -hmm. and then that's just been the combo for the time being um almost entirely but but the for going from one to the next was basically um i could I quickly i can tell the story of how i got i got to that um so the, this uh experimental music group i don't know if you call them that but it, this group amnesia scanner did my i, I can't yeah. actually i reached out to them um i just emailed them um, I was because I was a big fan. I was just like I, I sent them an email in like five different languages because they're they're very mysterious. I didn't know what country they were in. And I, was, I was like, we need to work together, which is, I don't rare. I rarely do that, but it worked out. They got back to me. They're like, yeah, we should do something. Um, and they and I had really not done a true music video at this point, and I certainly had not really fully animated anything spatially. Um, and so they were their their main note was like we we're thinking picturing this kind of huge towering festival stage you know like that you see at these big edm fests and stuff and it uh, you know maybe it you know it's moving or something but that, that's mostly what they're picturing um and so i zbrush like you can't do depth it's again it's two and a half d it's pretty much flat so i was mm -hmm. like okay i don't know what i'm gonna do for this like and i had i had started looking into unity and unreal because they were or they were roughly free they were available and it, i was like this seems like something I can just kind of like, I mean, it's like the ZBrush thing. I can just screen record. They didn't have the render function. They didn't have sequencer. They didn't have all these like anime, like virtual production things that they have now. Um, but it was, I, I had a sense of like, okay, this at least seems like a way that I could 
do like I, I can just make something happen. Um, I wasn't really thinking about VR at the time. Um, I was kind of think initially I was just doing mouse and keyboard tests um, and more kind of like FPS type type format. So what, what's on the screen right now is, is is a music video and that was created by. So I, I met a um, developer through like a friend of a friend. I don't remember who introduced me to him, but um, this guy, Eric Anderson, he was running this three story punk venue in Chicago and he was an unreal developer. Um, I just went to his place, went to this venue, just slept on their couch for like a week and just we just worked on this video and got it working. Um, he taught me a lot of the basics of Unreal and he had a uh, prototype Oculus um, headset, the DK2. Yeah. And so that's what I use for the camera. And then this, this whole video is basically me just, this is a live screen recording. This is maybe take 30 or something like that. We were just, because you couldn't render at the time. So you're just sending a live feed out to a separate laptop and just capturing it. And so it was myself palming a headset um, as the camera and then and and moving the you know with the WASD keys like an FPS moving it back, and then all the lights, all the character animations, everything triggered on the beat by my friend Olivia Rogers who um, had an Xbox controller. She was just like in the corner triggering everything, and we did like thirty takes. It, and with almost every video, I still do. By first take, it was like I don't really know. I know we're going back. I know the rough choreography of the through this three D scene, but I don't really know beyond that. Uh, and then by take 30, we had like, okay, we have to hit this moment by this, by this beat, we have to hit this by measure whenever, and then this happens and that happens. And it was kind of just like working through it while we were recording, which is, that's formed the foundation of yeah. everything since um, then, so. And Sam, so that like, that's a really good technical overview, but I mean, mm -hmm. myself just kind of like learning more about performance art really recently, um, in terms of like the rigging and the, char the character creation mm -hmm. and the camera angles, there's a lot of choreography involved, right? Um, yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's like positioning the like the where you are, where the content's going. How do you mm -hmm. sort of navigate that? Coming from a visual arts background, right? And then you, is it is it through your collaborations with performing arts experts, or you just what? How do you do it? Where does it come from? I think. Oh, like the cho the choreography. Yeah. I, maybe if I bring up so one video that you did. I know this is a super popular one, um, but the sour candy one. For mm -hmm. me, like that, this one is where, you, and I, it really came through in your your Fact magazine interview, mm -hmm. like because sure. this one to me, you really see the, it's all like, I guess in terms of an exhibition speak, it's like the visitor journey through the music video, but it's it's sure. choreography, right? Yes, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, uh, and and where, where does that come from, or how did I come yeah, to that? How basically? do you? Well, when you did this music video, for instance, is it mm -hmm. Lady Gaga's team that's like, this is how we want, or is it the black? or is it you that comes up with it no. or? to their credit they the especially for the for the sour candy video they they really let us do what we whatever like it was crazy yeah uh, and so and that's normally the case because we just only pick projects where that's where that's usually the case unless we take little client things here and there but um anyway yeah it kind of came from well okay as a kid i would play like half-life 2 and i would like play through it for the 10th time but i would like play through it cinematically where i'm like okay we're going to this level and then i would like rotate the camera so that we like see this vista right when this animation passes by and i, I would just do that as a kid so i think nate it, like innately i kind of was interested in that but choreography wise like moving the character through the space and stuff i kind of i think it's just it's come nat it's just a natural result of working within this medium and just deciding like okay i want to do like vr or some sort of 3d spatial thing and i want to have a character go through it um and i don't like 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 um you know keyframed camera motions and stuff mm -hmm. even you know even things that are like really nice like, they kind of just bore me like i kind of like to to the chagrin of my team sometimes like i kind of only like one shot videos because they feel like games to me like it, it just feels more natural so i think it's just yeah, it's been a it's just been a function of figuring out what works. Realizing, say for example, that um, I used to build sets like the sets in in ZBrush. So, and I'd be looking at it like from you know you would see it like this size on the screen. Be like, yeah, you're kind of rotating. You're like, yeah, this looks good. Like, I think I can kind of walk around. Like, maybe it does something in here. Maybe, and realizing that actually uh, VR. Uh, sculpting, like actually being able to sculpt the space in VR and walk through it mm. allows you to really feel the space more. It's mostly just like setting up, um, because I'm oftentimes the one performing it, it's just set, It's just giving myself something to do. It's like giving myself a little playground or like an obstacle course and being like, and just feeling out like, okay, I need some, like we need tension here or whatever. Um, but anyway, I'm not, I'm not trained in any capacity with that. I mean, I'm, I've been DJing for, since I was 15, like I, I understand, you know, sculpting a, you know, a climax and dropping it and like, you know, certain things like that. Um, and performing in, in certain ways, but 
um, beyond that, it's it was kind of, it's kind of just been learning on the job, I guess. Um, I'm really glad that you mentioned the playthrough bit too, especially mm. with Half Life after Half Life Two um, specifically. There were some artists that we interviewed, and playthrough was a really important part of their practice as well. Um, but oh, one one artist, I don't know if you're familiar with Robert Yang. Robert Yang. Oh it, sure, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, he was doing sort of like Half Life Two playthroughs as part of like a, a virtual online curatorial context. Oh but, amazing. But, but treating cool. like I, I'm I play a lot of World of Warcraft, but and I really love people that do playthroughs, but kind of use that virtual environment to construct film. Which mm -hmm. oh for sure same yeah which again like connects um to to other uh, to other artists that we interviewed David Blandy and Larry Achapong um that use game environments to do their film but I wanted sh I wanted to shift gears a little bit um to the metaverse because I remember I'm ready. on on um gaming and the metaverse your response was one of my favorites um I'm also going to bring up this because I really like this it was because the metaverse as a, as a definition is something that comes from science fiction primarily and is now really being taken up by big game and big tech um, to drive their own prerogative. So naturally, it's a really useful prerogative term. But when we were interviewing people, we got a, a varied response, which is which is healthy. But your response, um, I don't know if you remember, but you were like, oh, you mean like the meta way of playing a game? Um, Oh, oh, right. Yeah, sure. Yeah, because like when you're playing in particular like MMO RPGs, there's like a, a meta way of playing like the and the really hardcore player base kind of dominate the game landscape because of that meta way, which is like, I don't want to say it's the right way of playing a game, but it's the most successful way for completing the mm -hmm. game's content. Right. Um, but At least really, that time because it can it can change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, in terms of like the metaverse, what we are really advocating for to sort of compare it is whilst big tech and um, big game engines are dominating the space and they've got a space within it, so do artists and public art mm -hmm. institutions. So it's we just have to remember that it's not it's not the, the matter at, at all points. But I wanted to ask you again, how do you feel about the metaverse? <laughs> um, I feel I feel well, it, that's I mean, that's a that's a potent question because it's like I, I will say like most of the time my this is one of the only times that i've had uh ha dealt with the term of metaverse or have it have to kind of like think about it not in, a, in like a marketing context because it's so so based off of like so it, like i heard started hearing it through like meow wolf like experiment like experiential yeah. music insta museum type things and epic games and stuff like that and i'm oh it just seemed like another it just seemed like synergy, like any sort of buzzword that the tech industry would would use. I mean, the the, the fact that it comes from a brought like a, a, a past kind of sci-fi historical context kind of makes sense. It like it feels not. I'm not that surprised because I feel like a lot of times that sector that I have to deal with, but I, I really uh, have a lot of distrust for, um, gr grabs things at will from that kind of like cultural memory, like what, like for example, like cyberpunk and stuff, and kind of grab picks and chooses things that are useful to their to just marketing it but you know it has this it leaves all the political implications behind you know like just pulls out the like oh it's like a cool cyber guy and like and it's like it's it's foggy outside or whatever and doesn't really grapple with the fact that like you know you have to live in like a a, a yeah I don't know, a, a apocalyptic era for for that thing to come true so anyway um i feel i feel like i'm gonna have to deal with it and i have to reckon with that as a <laughs> as a concept i mean i think i think that it's a fine way to contextualize um, all the stuff that's happening right now, and for better or worse, you know, you you kind of don't get to define like, especially like even in the music world, you don't really like hyperpop. Like all the musicians that I know who are like technically hyperpop did not. I don't think many of them are fans of that term. I don't think it, or any other scene that I've like deconstructed club. No musician has hardly ever liked the term that was created for their genre. It's normally determined by the press or now it's by playlists. Mm -hmm. um, so you know having having a, a different commercial entity define the term that we then have to grapple with is a, a typical case for me so um yeah i think that yeah I, all the stuff that i'm interested in is within that it's just a matter of is do is is the stuff that i actually want to do um uh does it have a place in their version of the metaverse for example like 
because I'm pitching, I'm coming up with concepts and trying to make all these like, you know, experimental interactive mm -hmm. live stream improv shows and things like that happen. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of companies that are talking a big game about the megaver me metaverse, megaverse, that's what, that's what's next. Um, <laughs> they're, they're talking a big game about the metaverse. They're not saying yes to our, they're maybe saying yes to our project. If they, if they say, if they say yes and like, yes, we'll fund this, then they get bought by a gigantic corporation and all their people are fired. Like, mm. you know, I, so, you know, I'm just very distrustful of, of any, of just primarily just because of the recent history of it going through the tech industry, which is just how everything is these days. So anyway. Yeah. Um, you mentioned interactivity and experimental mm. in terms of your performances. And I guess what I really am within your work, I'm really drawn to the fact that you give your audiences a lot of agency in terms of, mm how to experience it, but also the content itself a little bit, um, which goes back into the, the metaverse, how much ag agency do you, that you have in it. Um, but there's a couple of performances, and I'm going to go through some of the files that you sent through to me earlier. Cool. But I just thought, because I guess when people think about performance, often it, it goes back to um, more traditional mo uh, methods of performance spectatorship. It's quite passive, but mm. you actually invite and actively encourage uh, your audience members not to just dance around the space, but be part of the, the content creation itself, don't you? Yeah, to an extent. I mean, th th we, uh, we've had, we've done that several times. I mean, we've done particularly like MoMA and, and some of the other performances mm -hmm. where like audience members will be involved or there's like a, for MoMA, we had a, um, there was a site you could basically upload as we were doing the performance, it was moving to this kind of like ruined space. Um, and all the, like the picture frames and stuff, like little elements of, of history in this, in the space, you could basically, people could upload stuff from their camera roll when they were there and it would get textured on you. Like you would see, yourself or your childhood photo or whatever yeah. in the space that we were moving through and performing through simple things like that simple like little and partially just out of just kind of like in a dj way like responding to responding to the audience live you know yeah. setting summing up setting up a scenario and seeing what's what's working and then having having a myriad of spaces that kind of do different things dramaturgically drama wise or, or visually to respond to that at the very most basic level but our interest is in increasing that it just takes more of a infrastructure to make it happen. Sorry, Sam, we're just gonna do a quick BSL changeover. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think I had the wrong image up earlier because um, you mentioned the dark, dark mofo one. Um, yeah, that might've been in the wrong folder, sorry. That, that's okay. Um, but there's this one I remember you were speaking at the Sonics Act mm -hmm. Festival. Yeah. And this was one where people were like, in real time uploading content to your artwork, correct? Um, uh, or, people, I would, that, that was responding to the audience live, like going yeah, yeah. through, people were asking questions live. That one wasn't getting up. That, that was early. I, I wasn't okay. doing up, uh, upload stuff on that one. No upload way. stuff is primarily dark mofo or, or um, MoMA. And then, um, some of our th things like, um, our unsound festival, oh, uh, stream last year. And then other, other live stream stuff. Live streams are the, honestly, the easiest cause we're, you're already, it's already, just, it's always already a, um, online interface between the audience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's one project, I get a little bit confused. So I remember mm -hmm. it's Danny Hall. Mm -hmm. So there's like the music video, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's four different personalities that go along yep. with, with the music videos. Um, sorry, YouTube ads. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, love to get Adobe in there. <laughs> But, my favorite company. So I'm gonna let this play a little bit. But in addition to this, there's like an online club as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping that, can you ex expand on this a little bit further? Because you, so you created like a music video, but then audiences are also in, allowed, or not allowed, invited to experience it online during a club that when, it, when it's running, they can sort of interact and walk around. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that, so, uh, ours was, we came into this project, um, into the Danny Harrell project, um, kind of, we, we, uh, a different team made a lot of the characters, oftentimes, almost all the time, we make everything from scratch. This time, a, a different team made the characters, um, not real virtual, I believe. Um, and then we came in and kind of expanded all the sets, did the kind of like, you know, spatial design stuff that I've kind of been talking about, and then did the motion capture performance, like animated and kind of brought it to life a little bit. Um, and so we we were handling all of that. And then in addition to that, a different team was was building out the WebGL, which basically mm -hmm. like 
stripped down experiences um, of of this. Just to just give like a, a, a taste of of you know this, this yeah. kind of space um, that people kind of kind of can move through and activate at certain times during the during the uh, like the album rollout, basically. It's this way, right? Yeah, and, yeah, and you yeah. enter the club, and there's the four mm -hmm. different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just gonna let. Uh, but to, to be fair, we we didn't do the uh, we didn't do the WebGL stuff. There's a yeah, different yeah. team that that handled this kind of stuff. And my browser's going funny. Um, Sam, in terms of the musical stuff too, you've got your own musical alter ego as well, don't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yep. Do you, can you introduce your musical alter ego? <laughs> sure. I mean, uh, I, I know I'm not supposed to. I don't know if I've sworn yet. Well, um, no, I'm not, no swearing, but it's DJ rude word beginning with F, right? Okay. Yes, <laughs> yes. DJ four letter F word. Yeah. Um, that actually was um, related. That kind of like persona was really was a result of Danny, actually. Danny yeah. Harl was doing, these, was doing the early Harlcore shows and... Um, Danny really has a sense for like characterization and like world building and you know things like that and it's just funny and he uh he gave me a call one time and he was like Sam would you like to do a new metal turntablist set because he knew I was I used to be turned or am or was a turntablist new metal turntablist set as DJ expletive um, I was like absolutely and it became it was like some of some of the best sets that I've had it was and it, and it was easy platform I found I found it to be an easy platform to do skits of different like you know just like uh, uh, these kind of like skits parroting different formats pl play like you know uh, art world stuff or like different scene things it kind of became an app just became an avatar for me for it became very useful to that i think the level like just ab abstracting it slightly away from sam rolf has helped me take it less seriously um be you know have more fun with it and start to explore skits and um, for all those those sets um I would hire voice actors and we would do like, I would have skits throughout the, like it'd be like a hour or 30 minute SoundCloud set or like a, something for Fort. Like we would, you know, I was doing, playing the uh, parent company um, Minecraft shows with all the PC music people and stuff like that. Mm. Um, and so I would hire voice actors, which is I think the first time I ever was doing that. And it just, it, it kind of expanded my understanding of theater and characterization and um, things of that nature. So um, DJ uh, Expletive is a, very yeah it's it kind of helps me fill the gaps and it's one of the things that's not really commercial right now like it's it's but it's but people like it um people like it a lot of times kind of more than my visual work uh just because i think in terms of format it's just kind of like it's easier to promote to a certain extent um so yeah it's yeah it's, it's been a fun a fun side project um sam so i remember when you were chatting to ben and i had listened to previous interviews outside of our fay two but something that I really wanted to ask you, because you work across these different disciplines, using these different technologies and not in conventional ways, um, I think, and I feel as though we share a, a similar ideology in that this technology happens so quickly and traditionally the role of the artist has been to cr not only cr to critique society but also the tools that are used. I, I yeah. wondered if you could expand on that, what you think the role of the artist is within the, the megaverse, the metaverse, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, I mean, cynically, they're the content, they're the unpaid content creator um, who, because thing, because you have to generate so many things so so fast, you need to crowdsource it, um, and you give them some, you give them buy-in into your platform so that you know they get company script in, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, social media responses in terms for hard labor functionally. Um, that's the cynical end. Um, the art, the artist role, otherwise, I mean, my, yeah, my perspective with that is that like, you know, historically there's been more of a gap between the artist and the, the tool. Like oftentimes it's like a, it's a, um, hand-me-down from industry. Like it's when it became cheap enough or like available, people started kind of playing with it and, and it take, takes some time to actually feel out the, ex the, um, uh, implications and the kind of specific nature of uh, an art making tool and these days not only are, is you know, just out an economic necessity are people like really intertwined economically and just like it, on the teams of big corporations that are making the things um, the things that they're making are coming out faster and faster and faster and faster to the point that mm -hmm. um, I feel like it not only flattens it to like a basic formal formalist level of just like you know what the, the, the effect flavor of the day um, but also, yeah, it, it kind of removes the longevity of the, 
the piece itself. It, I think that's, and I think that's intentional. I don't think that's like, you know, I don't think it's happenstance that it's ended up that way. I think it's in the interest of the platforms that host most of the stuff and the companies creating it, that things be flattened to just like immediate response stuff, because it's not helping them if you sit with an image for longer than half a second. Like, so there is it's in no platform's interest to support making or support things that are being made that are, that are meant to be consumed slowly, I don't think. Um, maybe with some exceptions, but that anyway, that's been my experience. Um, and just broadly, the, the role of the artist in the metaverse, like, I don't know, it's kind of hard to say. It's really hard for me to say without ju without just going to a cynical answer. I mean, I think um, the I ideally an artist would find a very, uh, would find a specific and kind of non-commercial way to express themselves that is not based off of like the metrics and value system that the platforms themselves are kind of setting up, which is like, you know, constant engagement or like whatever the metrics are, you know, like the mm. like constant engagement, like some things are great, like building community, like getting to know people, like, like uh, working quickly to a certain extent lets you iterate really fast. Like there is something to the uh, like work fast and break stuff model from the, the startup and tech world in that you can kind of, you you know, but to, but it, that, I think that the, that only, is only useful to an extent and is broadly harmful to art making in the long term. So. I don't know if that really answered the question. It's, it's hard to say because, like, I kind of don't. I kind of feel like where things are right now, just cynically, just specifically, just in the industry. Maybe this is like just like an American perspective, but I kind of feel like, kind of like with NFTs. I my perspective was like with a lot of that, the art is not the art is the rapper. The art has nothing to do with this. It's a, it's a convenient promotional tool. The artist is being used to paper over all the stuff happening behind the scenes and artists are really online they're going to tell people about it like they're the biggest patsies they have no we have no money coming in we need we're, we crave attention and so if as soon as you infuse any sort of money into our communities people are going to lose their minds and they're going to like argue over it and this and that but it's going to spread whatever you're trying to spread um so i think the way they're being used right now is just as like either unpaid labor or patsies to spread stuff um, and, and the, you know, at, at, in an ideal world, you can kind of, kind of carve something out for yourself, but it's really hard to do so in a world where everything's owned by like two companies. Um, maybe to sort of, I don't, to balance some of the cynicism or on a practical sure, level, please, Sam, please like, do. how do you balance, our, again, back to our original Fay 2 interview, you were like, you kind of need to constantly be in the public eye to have a cultural cachet but at the same time as an artist and what you've been speaking about there's a certain amount of like R&D or research and development involved and mm -hmm. how do you and Andy like because there's two of you right I know you collaborate with a lot of people mm -hmm. but how do you balance that as like a business um carefully I think I think well uh, we're always trying to so I think you know there is a there is a kind of a pressure for digital artists or whatever to be adopting whatever the newest thing is that's out like GANs or whatever, whether or not you have anything to say about it. We do try and at least um, keep abreast of, I mean, we play around with that stuff. We do like we do like Andy's been doing all sorts of series using kind of, um, you know, the, the GAN, BQ GAN clip stuff like AI assisted exploit, like taking, he'll, he'll make a sculpture and then use AI to assist the, the environmental, mm -hmm. you know, expansion of that. And then maybe he'll do some additional detailing. Um, we do a little bit, bit of that. Um, I mean, honestly, a lot of our most important R and D is done. It's done in the service of like a pilot or like a pitch or like we're trying to do, or we do like a live stream here and there. It's like we all the stuff we're like the narrative stuff we're trying to do, kind of is oftentimes done in service of trying to get a bigger project to happen. Mm -hmm. um, just because it's hard with with um, the way that just like fruit like, like running a experimental art studio is like you know we're not making huge margins on this so um you kind of have to find a commercial excuse for every single thing you want to try mm -hmm. um and maybe and maybe most of it won't make it to the final video like with the danny elfman video we were doing fluid dynamics we were doing all sorts of different stuff that didn't really you know you you, you add a lot of stuff to a project and it gets very bloated and kind of like there's too much things and then you pull back what's not working but then you but you've had enough experience you, like you've learned a little bit that you can maybe more intelligently implement it later so we kind of do it during production um, and maybe every once in a while and like in the market, I'll use it as an excuse to make a skit. But again, with these like little skits, these little like, you know, community, like scene critique like non-commercial animations it has a purpose. I have to feed the beast of social media to a certain extent, even though I'm not doing a very good job at it. Like I have to post something. And so I it's think, still functionally commercial venture. Yeah. I think you do a pretty good job on the social media front. 
as best uh, I can. I mean, with, with yeah. what I, my practice is. Um, but that leads me to my next question, because you both are working on a game at the moment, right? Mm-hmm. And slowly yeah so but yeah i saw these beautiful visuals that you posted recently that are towards the game right but i mm-hmm. in terms of funding it and its production um i was hoping you could expand on on it a little bit because it's not like a conventional um game development workflow is it no by no means yeah um so the the game is a where it is something we've been trying to do, we're wanting to do for a while. Um, and and like the different functionalities of it, like we're trying, we've got all sorts of different things we're playing with from like these different kind of creative modes to different other kind of like game loop stuff. But, uh, and, and we're in production. I mean, it's, it's I say it's slow because for the reasons that I mentioned before where um, we can't, I like, I have, I've had like five deadlines this week. Like I have, <laughs> we have to, and that's out of necessity. Like, like it's just like, we. I, we, we're trying to take it slower and have time for additional stuff, but when it, you know, to a certain extent, rent it keeps being, yeah, rent keeps being due, and despite you know what we want to say about it, so um, that's been keeping us like it's been a slow pace. But uh, we so basically, the the at least the economic context or like the the model that we're working with for the game is one of like audience participation, mm-hmm. and that's also like the meta the meta level too, like. So we didn't want to, I didn't want to just go away for three years or whatever, just working on a game, maybe sharing a screenshot every once in a while. I also can't afford to hire all of our devs constantly for that time. Mm -hmm. And we're very interested in fanfic and audience, um, you know, audience interaction or just like, you know, community. Like I've I've been part of some meme groups that uh, had discords where just they, they would build lore and they would build all these like internal jokes that, uh, you know, would spread to like little minion accounts and just like, you know, th- there's a lot in just like having a community like riffing, just like making even if it's, if it's dumb, like a, a, a kind of lore and a, a history and like internal, internal logic, internal um, kind of uh, terms and, and ideas get formed very quickly. And that seemed like a very interesting narrative thing to work with. So basically, all that to say is, um, the plan is that once we get it to like a roughly kind of playable kind of like okay we got something that's like basic and fun we uh debut it probably on a patreon just to just mm-hmm. to have like a, a like a very cheap one just to have some base level income that just gives you access to and maybe eventually it's just it's just totally free and the patreon gets you slightly more access i, I don't know but um uh access to the game and then we iteratively release it as we develop it but not just not just as we kind of just go along our way and not really paying attention like the audience will is going to be like kind of along with us so submitting you know fan art or character designs or like you know uh, actually like choosing what path we go on like almost like an rpg character tree where it's like okay you're here there's like three steps to get to it would be like 10 steps to get to multiplayer okay so to get like to whatever functionality or whatever narrative whatever thing that people are actually really responding to um giving people a little bit of control of over where we go and then along the way determining like okay to get to multiplayer we're going to need this many characters we're going to need this many you know this many more uh, subscribers to be able to hire this many devs little goals here and there and then the idea is the hope is okay so we've got this idea of player um uh, uh interaction or like participation in 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 the whole meta in the game that shouldn't be done just on spec like that sucks just like okay the yeah hey everybody like come pay to play my game and then create work for free to send us that like that sucks <laughs> i mean that's the model for a lot of stuff these days basically yeah. um but i didn't want to do that so we're looking at we're looking at like um fractionalized ownership stuff you yeah. know for as as crazy as the you know the crypto dow all that stuff world is i really do think that beyond just the 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 you know, vampiric specula- speculation that happens, which is, I think, just going to happen as a result of being in a capitalist system that it grows out of. I think there are a lot of really, real the stuff I'm psyched about is people being able to own own a piece of a project, the DAO, distributed aut- automated organizations, things yeah. like that. We're, there's a few like we're, that we're looking at. That's that we're going to probably get into that maybe after the first around the time we debut, which I'm really trying to have, have happen this year. We keep having like kind of cool stuff come that's like not it. It's cool like because it's like a cool musician or something like that, but it's not like the game. It's not like I keep yeah. thinking about like, this, this is like another music video is not going to make my practice more interesting. Like the game is way more interesting. So it's just a matter of getting to that point. But that, that's the plan. Can people contribute to it already, Sam, or get in touch if they want to be part of it? Or what's the best way to get involved? Good question. I mean, 
kind of like, I mean, really, I should be giving people more options for helping on that. Like, all we've done is just do an, like, when, when the F NFT thing happened, I was, I was really conflicted on many levels about, like, how how best is, how, how do I participate in this, if, if at all? And the way I thought about it, at least, was it was like a fun, we did a fundraising thing, selling off yeah. pieces of the game thing. So it went towards basic, produ like, early production. I was doing it in the in the form of these kind of, like, parody skits. Um, which let me kind of act as a bit of a release valve for all of the um, uh, depression and pain and spiraling that I had thinking about <laughs> like all this NFT stuff for half a year. Um, Cause our, our kind of like creative producer and like a, a creative inter audience, what would you say? Like user, user community designer um, head, uh, Kara Kittle had been telling me about it for a long time. And, I, and it, you know, it was a long time coming, but um, so we had made, we, we raised a little bit of money off that really, um, I probably need to debut something where people can kind of keep keep abreast of it or I don't, like i just i'm hesitant about asking for donate further donation because i kind of want to just give somebody something just like debut the alpha and then and then people can join on the patreon mm -hmm. so what we what i will say what we're probably going to do before the game debuts is that we've had all these interactive shows and stuff that we've done in the past and we've wanted to been doing and uh the big companies keep seeming interested and then they don't pick it up I think we might just start it and do like a pilot, like start a show, like a live stream show or something like that. Start the Patreon with that, that, that is part of the game world. And then hopping on that Patreon when it debuts um, would, would just help actually make the game happen. So that's probably the best way people have been reaching out with um, skill, skill stuff, like just because I've been looking for unreal developers, um, AI people, like it's, it's all in unreal. So um, mm -hmm. I'm always interested in, in devs who might be interested in like working for a friendly rate, at least until we get like a proper um, income stream. But yeah, that's kind of where we're at with the game currently. It's exciting. Um, but Sam, we've got around 10 minutes left. So right. I was going to open up to questions from Kay and Ava. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Alex. Hi, Sam. Um, what a great conversation. I'm sorry to oh, wait, interrupt. I need to listen on Twitch. I'm sorry. Hang on. I, was, I, was, I can't hear it. Sam's just Sorry. switching to the Twitch. To turn on, turn on the audio. Okay. All right. Go ahead. You might have a delay. <laughs> so I'm just going to talk for a little bit to begin <laughs> with, while with, uh, while we go through this. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you so much. That was brilliant. Um, so great to hear you talk about your work a little bit more. Um, I have a few questions here, but first of all, we have a shout out in the chat for uh, Kara Kittel from Trust. So I thought I'd, I'd say that one out loud. <laughs> um, Love them, huge fan. Uh, so the first question from Frankie does Twitch <laughs> zero zero. How much of your own personality goes into making these characters? Um, you must have a strong bodily connection to them. Can you give some examples? Thank you. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for the delay. Um, how much personality goes into the character? I mean, quite a bit. I mean, oftentimes, um, you know, it's always, it's, it's a weird process working in this kind of like mediated way where you're working with a musician who has like their own creative interests and stuff. Um, but most of the time we're given a fair amount of freedom. Um, I think a lot, I mean, really a lot of it, the char character design is really still where a lot of our painterly in, in inclinations come through. Like Andy, Andy and I will just be like, we'll be just, you just kind of sculpt in 3D claim. You just kind of like brush, brush in characters and you kind of pull and push things. And a lot of just our, our basic, basic just formalist kind of aesthetic preferences in terms of just like ornamentation and, and kind of flow and our interest in fashion, our interest in this and that come in there. Um, well, oftentimes that's, that's where we're part. I mean, sometimes these days, sometimes we're brought in to do like character, like avatar design and stuff like that. And that's kind of just fun. Um, you know, it's not, with a really interesting thing is when it gets into the performance of it, um, which can take all sorts of different, like depending on how you rig up or animate the character, it can move in completely different ways. Mm -hmm. It can have a completely different kind of personality. Um, so it's it's kind of this interesting process of between Andy and I, oftentimes, sometimes other artists, um, but but usually Andy and I, building the character kind of who we, to be who we think they are, um, having a bit of a dialogue, maybe he and I s swap characters between ourselves and kind of, and he gets, we get some more of his realism and then I get some, we get some of my more, you know, abstraction. So it's kind of a combination of both of us. And then it goes to the rigging team, oftentimes led by Andy. Um, and that 
then that's where it gets rigged up and stuff. And that's that's kind of out of my hands. I might have, might have I might have kind of designed it in a certain way. I might be like, yeah, I think it should, you know, kind of be more flowy or whatever. Um, but through this then very technical process, uh, a lot of the personality comes out, and um, it's uh, yeah, a, a, that that's and then how I then how I get it in my hands and then I can perform it and like see how it moves tweak it and then um add some of myself to it like give it yeah just where i'm at with the song or where i'm at feel feeling personally so at various points like it kind of bleeds in throughout the process oh i need to turn the twitch back on sorry hold on you're right i just brought up okay. as you were saying that so i just on. brought up matthew Deer's bunny dream as well as you were explaining mm -hmm. yeah um next question next question from one two three q s d k l s b s Catchy. <laughs> um, I heard you're into data moshing, but I don't really get what it is. Can you explain? <laughs> sure. Um, well, uh, I wouldn't say that I'm, I'm I mean, I'm, I'm certainly, I like stuff that is done that's data mosh well. Um, I just used to use it as like a, as a symbol, really, um, talking about this kind of stuff, um, especially when it comes to like, you know the rapid iteration of new tech creative tech tools and stuff like that because like back in the day data mosh so okay so data moshing is basically like you is this process where you kind of uh you go into the uh the way that vi so the way that videos are made they, they like they have like these bait these certain frames that set up with the it actually looks like and then the, to save space um it there are frames that just kind of uh describe the mo the change from the previous frame and so you can start removing those 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 kind of like signpost frames that are, say what it actually looks like, and so when it lacking that, it's just the motion. So you can start it starts a motion, and then you cut out the frame that would be the next goalpost, and it just kind of keeps going, and it kind of just like interprets mm -hmm. you know to a certain extent where where it goes. Um, that's an actual like glitch. It's kind of it kind of feels like GAN stuff. It kind of feels like you know uh, AI or whatever. It's not really. I mean, in a way, I guess in the way that the compression works, it's it's, it's a form of AI maybe. Uh, it's mechanical or digital, but um, Anyway, my, my interest in the data mushroom was just using it as like, that was this huge thing, or it was like, a, it was a fad back in 2012, something like that, especially in Chicago, where I went to school um, in the, like the digital, the glitch scene, there was a whole glitch scene, there was a glitch festival, it's really cool. Um, but kind of people kind of when it became as it became main mainstream, as much as something like that can become mainstream at the time. Um, it kind of just was what it was, it didn't really people did it, they did tutorials, they did their thing, Kanye did it in a video. Then we moved on and it was just like one of the, it was just, I, I just noticed it. I saw its life and at the time death, I mean, it's kind of back on TikTok now and people are doing really interesting versions of it. I don't know if it's still glitching the same way. Um, they're doing really kind of, I mean, th th this that's playing on the, on the Twitch right now is like, when yeah. it, this looks pretty, pretty, re yeah, it's like 2020. Anyway, it's, it's, like it's kind of had a resurg resurgence, but um, yeah, it's just been interesting to watch its life because it's like this potentially just very formalist or just, it's just a, you know, it's just an effect. Um, and it kind of has peaks and valleys in ways that I feel like are consistent. It just helps track like how does how does how do art forms get digested and, and, and used these days? Okay, we've got we've got a few more questions. Cool. Um, Queer Direct asks, what distribution channels have been most successful or accessible for your work, and where does it translate the best? Hmm. I mean. I mean, I'm I, I, because it's it's so much of my stuff is based on album releases. Or at least has been so far. I mean, it's like YouTube, but I don't really. I mean, it you know, and that's I don't know if I would qualify qualify that as successful. I think oftentimes most successful stuff is when I clip a music video. I clip like a section of it, and I maybe put in a weird like meme context or something like that. Like the the casing you put these things in is real. It's oftentimes more important to its success than the actual thing. Um, I'll do these, you know, very involved things that are, as soon as somebody clocks that's a music video, it's way less likely that somebody's going to want to digest it, I think. Um, but if you give it like, a, a, you give it, you remix it in some sort of way that's some, somehow contemporary or is like a format, you, you kind of remove, weirdly, if you remove some specificity that it's a music video thing and you kind of give it its own, a different vague specificity, that's just, this is very platform dependent. Like, and I think that that's not necessarily based on human nature. I think it's what works on like Twitter and stuff, but um yeah, I, the distribution channels have primarily been pretty tr traditional in terms of just like YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. Um, again, I've been like the format parodies and stuff where you can kind of make it look like other stuff people recognize, at least to a certain extent, really helps with that digestion, especially for stuff that's not just something very understandable, like my stuff with the weird stuff I do. 
Um, I'm, but I am interested in doing more, you know, community direct stuff, Patreon, Discord. I mean, I've been, I participated in them to a certain extent, but not to the extent that I probably should be. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Yeah, yeah. So it's it. The, the way we've been putting it out has been pretty traditional and with the game hopefully with something that's actually very participatory doing streams on twitch and stuff that's the stuff i want to be doing so anyway um just one very quick one before um i think that will be our final question is um uh, a question from pzx h i can't say it are all of dj f words sets <laughs> on sam soundcloud if not is there somewhere i can find the rest yeah almost all of them are all the good ones. Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure. I don't think I've missed any. You know, the, yeah. The, there's been a few here or there that are kind. Of, well, I mean, I do a lot. I do live stuff. Um, like I'll be playing uh, tomorrow night, Market Hotel in in uh, New York and Bushwick. Um, but those aren't recorded. But the like the the sets for the online shows or for the <clears throat> more important sets or whatever. Those are all just on SoundCloud. I need to do a new one. It's been a minute. Um, so yeah, if you're looking for more, you're kind of, you might have to wait for a second. But it, there will come a time pretty soon. I just have to get a little bit less busy. Okay, final question. Yeah. This is from River Saber. Um, Sam, what are you most afraid of in the near future and most excited about? Interesting question. Um, afraid of, I'm afraid of market consolidation, um, pitching to the same like two people uh, for the rest of my life <clears throat> to have any hope of anybody of more than like 100 people seeing my stuff. Um, I'm afraid of I'm afraid of being, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm grappling with different, different emerging like cultural movements and formats that, uh, and, and finding a way to um, more genuinely interact with them in way, a way that's just not like doing a, like a, like hello fellow kids type meme thing. I'm excited about, I'm excited people are getting, are, we're having these conversations about institution building um, about, you know, um, that in an institution like Serpentine is is interested in, in this kind of thing. Like it's a long time coming, um, because certainly I don't I don't I really don't expect Epic to come and save the day for artists. But I think as we grapple with it and come to terms with what this space is and what the artistic, cultural, and you know value and economic dynamics of that are, finding finding people kind of come to that realization together um, in this kind of like really weird time and start to talk about the strategies for how we carve out a space that is not entirely determined by uh, quarterly growth exponential growth of some american company um that's very promising and that's very exciting and there's just more tools and get like i'm you know once i get our game working like i'm just psyched to like play around more like that's fun um and have and have maybe a slightly more stable income than just music videos um but more broadly just just socially i think um the, these types of things of, of building communities together that are having fun maybe like play play spaces things that are responsive things that are you know academically interested but are you don't have to you don't have to like like you, you are in more fun spaces acknowledging that fun needs to happen or like that exciting or dramatic things happen um and that interesting intelligent people don't have to be uh in a white box to to do that i think is very exciting um well thank you so much for speaking with us sam let us thank know you. when when you have more info on the game as well i will the, the moment it comes out yeah um, I just also want to let everybody know that um, as part of the Fae 2 Art by Metaverse programming, we've got more lives coming up, which can be found via Serpentine's website, as well as training sessions around different Metaverse technologies. And also we've got some podcasts as well from different um, people that we interviewed from Fae 2 as well. Um, but thank you very much, Sam. Thank you, thank you all so much. I, I, I can't, I, Fate 2 really was very impressive. I, I usually am very cynical about these kinds of things. I mean, obviously people have been hearing it for the last hour, um, but the dot, like the, the whole piece was really heartening and exciting to read. And it, I, I felt a lot, there, most of it, I was just like, I mean, yeah, very, very into. So it's a pleasure and thank, thank you everybody for uh, listening. Thanks, Sam.